Hi guys, it's Vanessa. It's been a bit since I've wrapped up what I've been reading. I've been meaning to make this video for maybe two weeks at this point, but it just always falls apart at the last second and I just don't film it. But I am here and I have many books to talk about. I've listened to a lot on audiobook, mostly on my drives to and from work slash when doing chores. And I also have a bunch of graphic novels that I've been into that I'm liking. Also disappointing reads. I have plenty of those to share with you too. The first thing that I read since the last time I wrapped up and that I mentioned in my last wrap up video that I was currently reading was Fire and Fury by Michael Wolf. Yeah, this book is not that good. Uh, <laughs> like it is readable and it is engrossing enough to get through it, but there's really not that much there. I'll kind of explain the problems that I had with it. Number one was the writing and I think this is the worst thing about this book is how um, condescending and belittling it is written and how much it is styled like a political tabloid and political gossip. So I'll, I'll have some examples of kind of like demeaning ways that Michael Wolf frames his subjects and the things that are going on. So for example, this is how he talks about the children. Donald Trump's sons, Don Jr. and Eric, existed in an enforced infantile relationship to their father, a role that embarrassed them, but one that they also professionally embraced. The role was to be Donald Trump's heirs and attendees. Their father took some regular pleasure in pointing out that they were in the back of the room when God handed out brains. But then again, Trump tended to scorn anyone who might be smarter than he was. Their sister Ivanka, certainly no native genius, was a designated family smart person. Her husband Jared, the family's smooth operator. That left Don and Eric to errands and admin. In fact, the brothers had grown into reasonably competent family-owned company executives. That is not saying all that much because their father had little or no patience for actually running his company. Those things might have some semblance of reality and, and they're factual, but the way that they are expressed and the way that they are put in the text don't necessarily heighten this text to be of like monumental value as like a historical text that we're gonna go back to 20 years from now, 40 years from now. It seems just more like tabloid, something that the Daily Mail would post, you know? But I will say it was pretty engrossing in the way that like you eat lots of chocolate and lots of junk food. It like feels good in the moment, but it's not necessarily good for you. Going back to the content, there's not really that much new here. Nothing that we didn't already know or suspect about this administration. One thing that I did think was a little bit different, and I don't know how true it is, the way Wolf saw Steve Bannon, he really saw Steve Bannon as like the most politically cunning and smart person in the White House. And he also saw Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump as like complete morons when it came to politically savvy moves. They were supposedly the ones behind the Comey firing. They just seemed and they came across by Michael Wolf's writing as really power hungry, really bad decision makers. They were like the ultimate leakers in this entire White House. So they were the ones that were pushing all these stories in the media. And that in turn would make the Bannon camp in the White House also leak. So it was just like two competing camps in a White House trying to vie the president's time and power and obviously the people who have familial relationships with him have won so far. And finally, the ethics of all of this. And this is another problem that I had with this. The quick turnaround of it and just like the media hyper focus on him and he's on like every news channel. It really comes across as I really want to push my book and I really want to sell as many copies as I can more than I want to tell the truth about this administration as I saw it. And it's also the fact that the sourcing here is not very good. Sometimes he would take things that were off the record and and then all of a sudden include them in his book. And that goes to like a journalist's responsibility and journalistic ethics and what is okay in this moment and when can you say screw that. If maybe he had taken more time to source this all, make sure he has lots of people on the record, make sure that it is written in a way that's not like incendiary and trying to cause a stir in the reader. If it was written just less gossipy, could this have been a lot more powerful and damning as a, a text? And I think that that would have been the case. It could have been better, and that's the sad thing. The next thing that I read after that was from my multicultural children's literature class, and I read One Crazy Summer 
by Rita Williams Garcia. I actually reread this. I read it in physical form last summer and I read it this time around on audiobook and I really liked that experience. The narrator, CC Aisha Johnson, was really, really great. So my favorite part about this book, again, is Delphine. Delphine is the main character and this book focuses on these three sisters going to visit their mother who has abandoned them and left them. And it's set in California during the 1960s with the Black Power movement occurring in the background. I think this book really shines because of how the characters are written. They are just very complex. You can't really pin anybody down. Nobody is predictable. Everybody has layers to them. This book also really shines because it's so relatable, it's entertaining, and it's thoughtful. I relate a lot to Delphine and the way that she looks after her sisters. I also was very entertained by the sisters just talking to each other. I also think that this book shines because it defies all stereotypes. It expresses this history to us through new eyes, through a new lens of of the black power movements creating themselves to help their communities in comparison to how the news depicted them. We just get to see the goals and intents of the black power movement and we get to see Delphine view that through her child eyes. It's just a lovely book and I really really enjoy it. This is the kind of middle grade fiction that I love to read. I'm definitely gonna try harder this time around than the summertime to read the next book because there's three books in this series. The next thing that I read was The Magnolia Story by Chip and Joanna Gaines. I was kind of disappointed by this book. This is coming from someone who really enjoys Fixer Upper and I'll binge watch marathons of Fixer Upper and this book focuses on their history and I thought that that sounded fascinating. I want to know how they met and you know how their businesses have evolved and how they are at the position that they are now. But whenever we would get to a story, they would kind of really gloss over it, stay on the surface, keep their distance, and then just bring it back to a moral or an inspirational message to you. So every story felt like it went to this of work hard, believe in your dreams, miracles happen, and God creates these miracles for us. And that was really, for me, kind of frustrating because I don't need to be, I guess, told uh, an inspirational quote or message. I came to this because I wanted to hear just stories about their lives and the moments of their lives that have really defined them as people and instead it was always like they were trying to sell us a message and on the subject of like miracles happen which is something that continually came up in this book like yeah we could have luck and things could fix themselves and happen in a way that works out for you. But a lot of the time when they would say like miracles happen, it would be because they'd have like an investor at the end of it come and give them the money that they needed, thousands and thousands of dollars that they would say is because of a miracle. Or have a family backing them that could financially provide for them, even in small sums. You have a network, you have support, and they can help you out. And they would say it's like a miracle that they're helping me, when I don't really see that. And it might be because I'm a little bit cynical about the world. The worldview that they have, I don't think, is like 100% there with me. The next thing that I tried to read that I actually ended up DNFing, my first DNF of 2018, and I'm sad about this because I was really looking forward to this, is Her Body and Other Parties by Carmen Maria Machado. This is a book of short stories, and it's told from a woman's point of view about the way women's bodies are depicted, violence against women, all these different subjects and themes that I was like, yeah, I want to read about that. And this just, I think, was way too experimental for me. The fables and the sci-fi and the ways that she really like tries different things. I just think I wasn't I wasn't the reader for this. I think what really lost me, because there were parts of it that I enjoyed, was the SVU novella that's in here that's really long, like 60 plus pages. I, I was 40 pages into that story and I had no idea what was going on. Mind you, this was me reading while I was listening, hoping that that would enhance my comprehension, and it wasn't. I was so lost. I will say I really, really enjoyed the second story, Inventory, which is told from the point of view of a woman and her sexual partners that she has while the apocalypse is happening around her. And it's just a really fascinating way to tell that story, that apocalypse story. I read two other ones, I think, and those were more in like the 3, 3.5 kind of range. And then the SVU story, of course, lost me, <laughs> and I didn't read after that. So the next thing that I read after that was The Babysitter's Club, Christie's Great Idea. This is the first in the new graphic novel series by Raina Telgemeier, taking stuff from Anne M. Martin's Babysitter's Club series. I've never read the books, I never read the original series, but I did really enjoy this book. It's had some better days. 
you can tell it is very loved by middle graders. It's just in the same Reina Telgemeier style of her other books. I just love like her cutesy drawings. I love just how the relationships are formed between these four friends and how you think you know what somebody is going through, but really you don't until you guys get to that stage of your friendship when you can confide in each other. So I really, really love this. And I have picked up the next one in the series. This one is The Truth About Stacy. And last but not least, the last thing that I read and finished was another thing for my multicultural lit for children class and we read Esperanza Rising by Pam Munoz Ryan. I was really excited for this because I've had it on my TBR, like a mental TBR of like middle grade classics that I wanted to get to eventually. I have attempted to read this book before and it didn't work out. I kind of just put it down and I think audiobook really propelled and, and made me finish it also because I had to read it for class. I really like the writing in this book and I think that it touches on sentimental moments that I really like how Munoz Ryan writes them. The grief and you know the challenges and the difficulties of moving to a new place as a migrant and the way that she symbolizes grief and these challenges using things in nature and in you know memories that she's had from her family. The way that she wrote those passages were to me very sweet and some of my favorite moments of this book. I think where I struggled with this book and why it was a little bit more difficult than One Crazy Summer for me to finish it is that the characters and the things that are happening the plot is very very predictable and books for children don't have to be predictable they don't have to be spelled out for you from page one and this one I felt like it kind of was I knew that she lost somebody close to her at the beginning she had to do something new because of this loss and it was gonna be difficult and she was going to come out of it in the end triumphant and as a new person as a more mature person there's nothing wrong with that I just think it was the execution of that and the way that I just expected everything that occurred and and it happened the way that I expected it. I also thought that the characters were really missing something. They were lacking a little bit of death. I think Esperanza is a good enough heroine for us to follow, but I think that she's not as memorable as many other main characters in middle grade books that I've read. I will say I did really enjoy the author's note at the end and Pam Munoz Ryan explains the inspiration for the story and how her grandmother inspired the story as well. That is it for all the things that I have read. Let's briefly mention the things that I am trying to read slash I have out and need to get to. Romantic Violence by Christian Picciolini. This was in my Get Informed TBR I think um, and it was one that was recommended on Twitter by people that I follow as a good thing to read after Charlottesville. And this is Memoirs of an American Skinhead and it follows Christian Picciolini, his childhood and being involved in those kinds of movements and then realizing, no, this is not me, this is not who I want to be, this is wrong. And kind of what leads people to join these groups and how you can kind of lose yourself in the messaging and, and what you're actually like preaching and abiding by. I'm on chapter two. We'll see what I end up thinking about this. I already mentioned that I got the second Babysitter's Club. I'm also kind of in the middle of Goldie Vance Volume 3. I'm excited about this. I just found out recently that Goldie Vance is going to be made into a movie. What? And Carrie Washington is producing and Rashida Jones is directing. I keep telling you guys you need to be reading this series, so why aren't you? <laughs> I'm also reading We Gonna Be Alright by Jeff Chang. I've only been reading this on my breaks, aka why I haven't gotten very far. And as for what I'm currently listening to, I am listening to Born a Crime by Trevor Noah and I am six hours into it and it's almost nine hours. So the best parts are definitely when he talks about his family and talks about growing up. Also just like the funny, funny stories that he talks about. I just crack up laughing every time he does accents and just the way he says, please, please mommy, please. Thanks so much for listening to my long wrap up because I haven't wrapped up in a while. I think it's been two weeks and that's not good. I like putting up videos at least once a week. So yeah, think of me and hope that I'm getting both my work life good and my school life good and then extracurricular life good too because we all need to have a life outside of school and work. Thanks so much for watching my video and I will see you in my next one. Bye bye.